It's one thing to be abandoned by people that you have a relationship with, but not very deep, but it's another thing to be abandoned by family. This, I've sort of incorporated a little bit of a wider view to establish your mentality on not just general abandonment, but the person who's been abandoned, the abandoned man or the abandoned woman. But I'm focusing more on the abandonment of the individual member of the body of Christ. And in particular, the abandonment of one of the members of the remnant body of Christ. Because one thing I can promise you, as we approach the return of Jesus Christ, abandonment is going to be rampant. Now, I've taught you a lot on how to identify the apostasy or the falling away. And it's easy to identify in that the falling away is associated with two major things. One, the attachment of that individual to lawlessness, which is the, the ignoring of the word of the Lord or the word of God, the law, if you like, without associating the law with the Old Testament, the legalism of the law, legalism in general, but rather associating it with a removal from adherence to the word of God. In particular, not just the Old Testament, but transversing over into the New Testament. The New Testament being the word of the Lord, the word of Jesus Christ regarding the church of Jesus Christ and the word of God which governs the kingdom of God, this dispensation, which carries on from the resurrection all the way through to the second coming or the return of Jesus Christ, all the way up to the organization of the body of Christ and its governing of the planet for a thousand years rule and reign. When those have been found faithful in the remnant, in the remainder of the body of Christ, and those who have been found faithful and have been proven as governmental in that kingdom will be given positions of authority. To whom have been found faithful and worthy, they will be given positions of government within that thousand-year rule and reign when our bodies have been changed and we've been given not just positions of authority but spiritual authority to govern those who remain upon the earth and those who are born into the earth. Make sense? So there is a reward process that's involved in that. In the same way, we look at the life of Jesus when most of what he experienced during his three and a half, minist three and a half years of ministry involved preaching the gospel of the kingdom but also a great deal of rejection and abandonment by those that he came to help. Primarily, first off, the Jews who rejected him and then the statement he made in general was because my own people have rejected me now I will make the gospel of the kingdom available to those who are not of the Jewish faith I'll make it available to the Gentiles who are now going to be grafted into the inheritance of the Jews so I thought I would include this particular passage of scripture to look at the abandonment of man by looking at the abandonment of the son of man and then realize that the apostasy or the falling away of the saints would lead our way to understanding that when we see a mass exodus away and out of the church and the buildings known as the church, when we see that happening, and it's happening right now unless you're blind as a bat, it's going to continue. The falling away of the body of Christ is going to continue until you're going to feel like there's nobody left. But there is a portion of the church left. And that faithful portion that is left will be an open door to those who A, recognize their mistake, and B, those who have made a decision to leave but then change their mind and come back. So all the way up to the return of Jesus Christ and he's coming in the, in the clouds, the open door will stay there. There will be a continuation of the open door for those who change their mind, the prodigals, and come back, and those who get saved in the process, those who are on the, on the fence, so to speak. There will always be an open door of salvation available to those whosoever will. There does come a time when the door is shut. Jesus talked about it, and you're familiar with that, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it'll come a time when the transition period is closed and those who had the opportunity and have consistently said no, that door will be shut to them. And you hear Jesus talking there about the marriage supper of the Lamb, who let you in here? You don't have a wedding garment. You faked your way all the way through it. Now the times where you can't fake it anymore because I've identified you and now the messages of the gospel will gather you up and cast you out. Remember that? All right. So it remains a situation where the body of Christ has to really identify itself with the values of the kingdom, recognizing how Jesus handled it, and that we are to expect that in these last days there is going to be an awful lot of abandonment, not just of some, but of the majority of the people who had never had their faith grounded in an understanding of what it meant truly to be a Christian, which is a follower of Jesus Christ. The reason for that is that toward the end, the prophets are going to be the prime, prophets and the apostles are going to be the primary imparters of truth. 
because the evangelists are limited in some respect as to how far they can take the education of the body of Christ. They're limited in their ability to teach people the deeper things of the kingdom because they are limited to salvation for the most part. They'll tell you that evangelists operate in signs and wonders. Primarily, yes, to get the carnal mind to believe in signs, wonders and miracles and therefore vis -a -vis in the Son of God. Therefore, opening their heart to salvation and opening their heart to Jesus. But when it comes down to forming a salvation foundation in Jesus Christ, it takes more than signs and wonders. Because if you read the New Testament, you'll discover that Jesus said, you're not following me because of the signs and wonders. You, you followed me because I fed you, but you didn't follow me for the food, the spiritual food, the word of God. You didn't follow me for that. You followed me because you were getting something you wanted. But what you wanted wasn't the food of the gospel. It was, it was physical food. Your hunger and your thirst was not after me or the kingdom. It was after stuff. Many people came to me, how do I get saved? And Jesus said, what's your really asking him is not how to get saved you're asking me how do I get how do I flow in signs and wonders and miracles and that continued right over into the New Testament after his resurrection with Simon the sorcerer where the disciples said you know your heart's not right with God Peter said you know you don't want Jesus you want the power to lay hands on people and see him get baptized in the Holy Ghost and that's 90% of the church it's it's pathetic and when things become inconvenient for some of your friends they don't come to church anymore except when they're sick or they have a car wreck or something they're on the phone then asking you help pray for me do this do that do that in some instances it's aggravating when there's a drought they show up at your front door and my job is to equip you so you don't come on my front door you go to his front door see your expectation should be in your relationship with Jesus and with the Holy Ghost and with all the angels of heaven and with the Father and everything, every trial and every expectation, every tribulation that you go through is preparing you to trust a little bit more in God because men let you down, even me. I don't want to. Sometimes I will. Sometimes they come and knocking on the prophet's door. The, you know, the prophet didn't answer the door. Sometimes they come banging on Jesus' door. He didn't answer them either. Why should I? Why should I come to your house? Well, I'm a man under the throne. This is true. Why should I come to your house? Why should I do this? Believe ye, I can do this? All the time he was testing him. Blind man coming to him. What do you want me to do for you? Well, what's the matter with you? I, I, that I might see, Lord, no bad attitude. I know what you're capable of doing and I believe you can do it. The only thing that causes Jesus to do anything was the fact that you demonstrated faith in him. But you're going to be looking around seeing some of the people that were at your wedding, some of the people that, you know, at your grandpa's funeral, and they're not here anymore. And you're going to, why aren't they here? Must be something Pastor Robin did. I mean, look at all the people that are bl blaming other people now for things they never said, never did. They don't look in the mirror and say, well, what have I done? Oh, no, it's not me. It's got to be him or him. It's got to be somebody else. It can't possibly be me. Therefore, they get offended and they leave the church. And what have they effectively done? Played right into Satan's hand. You can't criticize and condemn other people when God has forgiven you so much. And then I started thinking the other day about Jesus and Judas and Judas coming to Jesus and betraying him with a kiss. Can you imagine the hurt in the master's heart when he said, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? You could have at least been honest and say, there he is. But he didn't. You even betrayed me with a further betrayal by pretending that you loved me. I want you to be prepared for that because the time's going to come. The Bible says it will. Jesus said it would. Where parents will betray children. Children will betray their parents. Where brothers will betray brothers and sisters. They'll turn you in for a reward. You can't imagine that happening, can you? But it will. They'll want to know who are these, who are these people in your household that, that, that say they love Jesus Christ? Who are they? It may not happen in the next five or ten years, but I believe it will. Who are those that are, that are practicing and doing these things and worshiping a God that it's been condemned that you shouldn't worship? Remember, if the Lord comes soon and that peace treaty is signed, within three and a half years, Antichrist will break his, his uh, peace agreements and move into the temple in Jerusalem, the temple mount, the new, the new uh, temple, and will cause agreements to be made that will uh, no longer allow anyone to bring sacrifices into the temple mount which will mean then in practicality that the worship of God Jehovah in any of its forms will be will be outlawed that could be the catalyst that causes people to turn their, their family in who worship Jehovah or Jesus for that matter do you follow me because there's going to be a beginning turnaround at the mid that mid three and a half year period where many Jews are going to begin to convert to Christianity the, your involvement has to step up a notch. Your children have to know this stuff. When they go to school, they're not going to hear anything like this. Which goes back to the worship of Baal and the golden calf and all that kind of stuff, which brings us into the 
into what's going on now. When, whenever you start banning Christianity, ban, banning the worship of God, taking God out of the schools, out of our laws, out of our societies and out of our government, you create a vacuum. And when you create a vacuum, you invite increasing wickedness, national destruction, public nakedness, wicked, the weakening of marriage, gender values become blurred. I don't always understand the love of God, the, 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 the unmovable love of God that's in Jehovah's heart. But I know this, that, that, that God didn't, he brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet he still had grace toward Lot, who put up with their foolishness and their wickedness. But their wickedness finished up killing them all. And when his wife turned around missing what she'd left, that look killed her too. But he had mercy on Lot, because at least Lot knew in his heart where he was was not right. <laughs> They weren't interested in hearing his judgment. I said he said he sat at the gate. John chapter 6, please. John chapter 6. Awesome. Now I'm going to go to uh, verse 35, please. I want you to listen carefully because you're going to have to really think about this. Now we know that there's a part of the scripture here that gets confused very quickly because he talks about I am the bread of life. Now you know when he talks about the bread of life and he's talking about his blood, that he's talking about his life in general, that his body is meat indeed and his blood is, is, is drink indeed. In general format, that's simply saying that we are talking about the body of Jesus, which was crucified on the cross, and his blood that was shed. He's talking metaphorically about Jesus Christ, his body and his blood. The blood's the life. The body is that which was crucified for him. So we talk about metaphorically the blood and the body. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the price that was paid, the sacrifice of Jesus, and the blood of God, which was his own blood. Jesus' blood was God's blood, yeah? Yeah. So we understand that became the overall sacrifice for your sins was his body and his blood. That's all you need to know basically, okay? The blood and the body are the two parts that became the sacrificial uh, lamb, okay? The sacrificial lamb. So he said, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. There's the, there's the body part, but we're not talking about cannibalism here. We're talking about when we take on the persona of Jesus Christ, when we, when we partake of his body, the, like the emblems are, the, 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 the wafer and, the, and the, fruit, the fruit of the vine, when we take on those emblems, we are literally ingesting who Jesus is, not was, because he's still alive. When we ingest him, we have ingested the embodiment of the Son of God, right? So we all become sons and daughters of God, right? Not the Son, but a Son. So he says, he'll never hunger, who believes in me and believes in me shall never thirst. So what he's saying is, he becomes my provision. Remember that. A man or a woman who is born again by the Spirit of God is never alone, never hungry, never without provision. Follow me? Always has the name of Jesus Christ to call on who will make provision for you. No matter what your circumstances in the natural, he will always lift you up. Now listen to this. But he said, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe in me. Now I'm going to talk about the abandonment of man now, right? The abandonment of the Son of Man came first so that he should know what it feels like to be abandoned. You will too. You will too. Some of you have felt abandonment of people. But when you get abandoned by the church, it stings. When the ministers of the gospel get abandoned by the very people they were sent to, it stings. Not as bad as it stung Jesus because he wept every time he felt that. But he said to you, you've seen me. Now he's talking to his disciples as well as some of the Jews who had followed him. So his disciples were both Gentile and Jew. Here is all Gentiles. But he said, you still don't believe me. He says, you follow me, but you don't believe me. Because if you believe me, you'd understand what I was talking to you about. Eating my body, drinking my blood, you don't get it. And the majority of the church don't get it. That's why they leave. See, Jesus said, you couldn't leave me if you had eaten my body and drunk my blood. And I'm telling you, 90% of the church are not connected to Jesus Christ. You've got to be born again. See, what does it mean by born again? Born again, you've got to have to learn what it means to eat the body and drink the blood. The baptism is a type of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's something somebody does after they've received him into your heart. You've got to have a revelation of eating the body and drinking the blood before you even get baptized. People get baptized, they think they've eaten the body, drink the blood. No, you haven't. And then remember, because Paul says, don't touch the emblems if you're not right with God. Why? Because you drink damnation on yourself. And many people have become sick and they die. You see the revelation in that? So if you're not sure you're truly born again, get your heart right, get born again, understand the revelation of the body and the blood, then you can take the emblems. But to take the emblems without knowing what it is to eat the body and drink the blood, you're on the wrong side of the cross. That's just religion. He said, have you not houses to eat in and drink in? Listen to this. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. Very comforting. What he's going to say to you here is this, and you need to know this one. God never, ever, ever, ever abandons you, and he will never forsake you. Now, Jesus said that. 
We all quote it, but we don't really get it. If you got it, you couldn't leave this place. Not if God put you here. It would be impossible for you to leave here any more than it would to walk away from your wife when you know you have a covenant with her. What if you're not happy? A lot of married people aren't happy because I've eaten his body and I've drunk his blood and my wife, I'm responsible for her too. The blood of Jesus Christ condemns me as well as holds me accountable. <laughs> Don't you think you're the only ones that the devil screams in your ears? He wants you to break covenant. Why does he want, to, want you to break covenant? I'll tell you, it's real simple. It's not complicated because the devil knows God will never forsake you. The only way that covenant can be broken is you walk out. I'm telling you the truth. Why? Because you're created in the image of God and you can do any stupid thing that you want to do. You can change from being a, a preacher of the gospel to a mass murderer in five seconds flat. You can go from a preacher of the gospel to a street walker in two seconds. What's the, what, what happened? You made a choice that was very bad. But thank God he is faithful to forgive you and, and, and cleanse you from all your sin. If you'll ask him from your heart. And what happens then? He restores you. And he expects you to turn around and come back home. But the devil knows if he can keep you out, God can't make you come back. And that's why you have stupid people gathering together, encouraging you to stay gone. The prodigal son didn't have anybody to tell him, go home. The father was there every day, putting it on his heart. But the prodigal had his, had his heart blocked off. His heart was so hard. He was unforgiving and bitter. Then one day, tell me if I'm not right. One day he said to himself, one day we're in our right mind. And he stopped eating that pig food and his brain cleared for a minute. And he said, in my father's house, the servants eat better than I do. I'm going to go home. And he said he picked himself up, dusted off the mud. And he said as soon as he got over the hills above his father's home, there was his daddy. That's what's kept me going all of these years because he's just and faithful. But I had to turn around and go home. When you stay planted where God tells you to stay planted and you do the best you can and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to wake up some morning and say, God, why did I do that? How could I think those thoughts? God, help me. And you feel the cleansing blood. You can't stay mad at God and you shouldn't stay mad at yourself. And you know that God has the power to forgive sin. Where else can you go? All that the Father gives me will come to me. See, they'll come to me. I can't go to you. You've got to come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. Next verse. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. This is the will of the... No, I don't think he didn't fight that either. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all that he has given me, I will lose nothing. Remember I told you about predestination? People do not think I know what I'm talking about. I do know what I'm talking about. How can an omniscient God not know whose are his? Have you ever wondered why he perseveres so strongly? All he has given me, I should lose nothing. There is no way that God will loot predestination. That God always has set aside and put his hand on, like we talked about Moses on Sunday. When God has got his hand on somebody to Moses' Hebrew name can be translated rescuer. Those whom God has rescued, he gives them the ministry of becoming a rescuer. And it's so powerful when you think about it. There are some people that you just can't kill. But there are some people that the devil tries to kill them, tries to take them out, even in the womb, tries to kill them. And I'm telling you, like Moses, something happens and they get around the corner, they escape. They get rescued by God. And then down the road, whatever happened to him? Oh, he's got a church of 500 people now. Oh, really? So the one who was rescued becomes a rescuer. The one who gets rescued becomes a rescuer. The one who was lonely is raised up. Now he's got three or four kids and he's doing something great for God. Next verse. And I'll raise him up at the last day. Predestination. People don't believe it. It's true. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Next verse. Then the Jews complained about him because he had said, I am the bread which comes down from heaven. Now listen to this carefully. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, and his father and mother we know? How is it that he says, I've come down from heaven? You see, they didn't know who he was. No clue. Because he had a human body, a natural body. They continued to look at him as a human being, a natural human being, which he was, but he was the son of God. Jesus answered and said, don't murmur amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who has sent me draws him. See, predestination again. But, but you, people don't understand that. The ones who won't quit on God, the remnant are determined to be the remnant. The others, you're wasting your time. You can't get them to follow God. No matter how much you devote your whole life to people who don't have a heart for God, you can't help them. If you were to turn the pages of the book of life, you won't see them in there. But there are many whose names are recorded in the Lamb's book of life in your country, all over the world. Their names are in the book. They don't know it. And then when you preach the gospel, they take the bait. And then they try to throw the hook. They can't throw the hook. Why? Because their names are in the book. Don't let anyone 
kick you out of the house. Amen. See, you're better off getting rid of them. Next verse, please. 65. It's written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught by God. Therefore, see, the prophets teach you concerning the latter day. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, they will come to me. Why will they come to you? Because they have been taught by God. The prophets will be taught by God, and those who have a desire to know will hear, and they will obey, and they will follow. Next verse. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, except he is from God. He has seen the Father. All, all the more reason we should believe him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Why do we believe him is the point, you see? Because we, once we have heard the gospel of the kingdom, and we've heard a truth that's been taught by the prophets concerning the Father, and they know who he is, then we believe him. Why do we believe him? Because it's taught by the prophets and they know what they're talking about. Yeah? I am the bread of life. Glory be to God. Next verse, real quick. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, but they're all dead. This is the bread of life which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and never die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. They didn't get it. Therefore, the Jews quarreled amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They didn't get it. Why didn't they get it? They couldn't get it. Why? They didn't have any revelation of what he was saying. Why not? Because their names were not in the book. What? How could anybody sit in a house which God brought them to because he wants them to get it? Many, many, many of these folks, their names are in the book. Some of them are prodigals. They'll be back. But I can't stop preaching the gospel to those who stayed because they're the reason I'm here. But the ones whose names are in the book, they'll come back because they're prodigals. But some of the others that left, they had a shot at it. Some of them won't come back because they're part of the apostasy. It's not my job to pick who is and who isn't saved because I don't know whose names are in the book. So predestination don't help me. Helps you if you take the hook. He says, uh, unless you eat the flesh, drink the blood, you don't have any life in you. No eternal life in you at all. So you can play the game. You can go to the church. You can pay your tithes occasionally. <laughs> right? But your, your name's not in the book, therefore there's no life in you. you you've got to get to the point where you're going to find out if your name's in the book or not. Now I know that's confusing for a lot of people because there's literally hundreds of thousands of people who go to church who aren't saved. And how do we know that? Because you know that there's no life in them. There's no, there's no faithfulness in them. You give them all the teaching, one sticks and one goes. One's taken up, one's left. Why? Because some, some eat the, the bread of life and some spit it out. Next verse. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, they have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day for my flesh is food and my blood is... Next verse. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. That's what he's feeding on. That's my life. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. He who feeds on me will live because of me. Next verse. This is the bread of life which came down from... How many times he's got to tell them this? Next verse. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Next verse. Therefore, many of his disciples... Listen to this. Many of his disciples, followers of Jesus, when they heard this, they said, this is a very hard saying. Who can understand this? Listen to what he says. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples were complaining him, he said... Are you offended? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend and descend as he was before? How are you going to handle that? See, he's identifying why you're offended. Because you're not saved. You're not, you're not even close to being saved. If this offends you, what's it going to be like when you see me come and go, come back and go and come back again? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh doesn't profit anything. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Listen to this. But there are some of you here who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning... He knew from the beginning who they were who didn't believe. How did he know from the beginning? Predestination. He knew those whose names were in the book. Do you want to start seeing it now? Why are you sticking in here? I'll show you why. Because Jesus knew from the beginning. Next verse. And he said, therefore have I said to you, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. What does that mean? How can the Father grant something that they haven't received in the name of Jesus? Who puts their name in the book? Jesus or the Father? Therefore, Jesus, God wrote their names in the book before they even had a chance to hear the gospel. Next verse. From that time on, many of his disciples went back and they walked with him no more. You should be on the phone encouraging these folks, these prodigals, to come back and fulfill their destiny. You need to hear the truth. And then you need to share that truth with other people. From that time on, they went back and walked with him no more. Next verse. Then Jesus said to the twelve... How many of you want to go too? You've got to stay because you want to. But Simon Peter said, <laughs> and he gave Jesus more grief than any of them. Whom shall I, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God.